In college football 25, I have an 84% win percentage, which is good enough for top 10 in the world. So if you want to see five things you should do every single game for a high win percentage like this, stick around after the intro. If you guys are looking for fast, cheap, reliable coins for your College Football 25 team, check out my coin sponsors at MMOXP and use discount code MONEYSHOT for 5% off your order. Link in the description below. The champ is here! Welcome back, Money Team. Today's video, I'm going to go over five things that you should be doing every single game. And if you're not doing them, they're most likely costing you wins. These are things that are really important, and I show them in every single gameplay video I do. But today, I'm going to focus on them because they're really important, and I realize that a lot of people aren't doing them. So before I do, if you guys want to see more videos like this, please make sure to be a subscriber. Hit the like button, let me know in the comment section. And if you guys need more help or more money plays, you can download any of my ebooks instantly simply by clicking links in the description or the top pin comment. Now, for my first tip, and this is something that I show in every single gameplay as well, I'm going to make adjustments to my entire roster. This is something that you have to do no matter what team you're using. I know a lot of people, when I hit the pause button at the beginning of a game to set my depth chart and make sure that I have everybody in the right place, a lot of times my opponent will try to go right back into the game. I don't care what team you have or how good you think they are, even if they're better than your opponent's team, there's still advantages to be had in your depth chart. So you always want to make sure that you go to your depth chart and make the appropriate changes so you can maximize the talent on your roster and maximize your scheme. One of the most important things I'm saying your depth chart is to favor speed, especially when it comes to skill position players. Like if you have any fast players at the back of your depth chart, like this 97 speed running back, a lot of times I'll make him my starter and I'll still use him in passing situations where I'll use the other running back in running situations. When it comes to receivers, speed is probably the most important thing. So I always make sure to have my top three fastest receivers just as long as I'm not taking somebody who's a really low overall and putting him above a really high overall. But at the end of the day, I want to favor speed. Because one of the most important things a receiver does is stretch the field vertically and try to make plays over the top. But it's also important when throwing short because you can get longer catch and runs if your receiver is faster. A simple drag can turn to a much bigger play if your receiver is fast enough to run away from every defender. On the defensive side of the ball, it's very similar. As you you can see right here we have a 78 speed starting outside linebacker where I have a backup linebacker in the middle linebacker spot who's an 87 speed so I'm going to put him as a starter at outside linebacker just in case I'm in a situation where I got to spy Jalen Milrow or something like that with 78 speed is not going to get it done. I also have a lot of lowly rated corners so since the overall rating isn't much different from one to the next I'd much rather have my 96 speed cornerbacks covering deep so they can't get burnt very easily or even sending one of these 96 speed cornerbacks on a cornerback blitz is going to be much more effective than somebody who's in the high 80s. Now when using higher rated teams you're still going to want to favor speed a lot but you're also going to want to take into account what their abilities are as that's going to make a big difference as well. And you also want to make sure that you do what's best for your scheme and how you like to play. This receiver here Dylan Bell he's my highest rated receiver. I bench him just about every single time for uh, Humphreys based on the fact that Humphreys is seven speed points faster. But you can see I'm also putting a lot of abilities on the bench as well. So if you like to play uh, a lot of possession catches and a lot of um, you know dink and dunk uh, receiving this might be a better option for you but me personally like I said I like to stretch the field and I like to sh turn short uh, catch and runs into long catch and runs I also have two 98 speed receivers but the tiebreaker is going to be that one of them has takeoff which means they're going to significantly get off the line of scrimmage faster so I'm going to make him my third receiver while I also have one that's a 98 speed with shifty meaning that he's going to make people miss a lot more so I'll put him as my fourth receiver and I'll also use him more as my punt and kick returner and you're also going to want to take it a step further and do manual substitutions on this next play the second I see my opponent take off and run with Jalen Milrow I know I'm gonna have to spy him for the rest of the game so to make manual substitutions all you have to do is hit the Y or triangle before you go into a formation and that will bring up the ability to manually substitute your players so since Jalen Milrow is a 90 speed player I want to make sure that my fastest linebacker is in a spy and my fastest linebacker is this linebacker here who is a 94 speed so I'm gonna make sure that I put Wilson in the position that I need him to be so that he can spy Jalen Milrow for the rest of the game even though this guy is a much higher rated overall player he's still slower and he'll still get beat by Jalen Milrow if he decides to roll out for context though, if I didn't make any adjustments to my depth chart at all, the guy who would be spying Jalen Milrow the entire game would be this 78 speed outside linebacker named Chambliss, who I bench every single time. Can you imagine how much he'd be getting roasted by Jalen Milrow's 90 overall speed if I didn't replace him? Next up, I want to go over the importance of reading the defense every single play, but none of that's going to do you any good unless you do this first, and that's setting up your audible plays. A lot of people will just choose a play and run that play without getting the full benefit of running an entire offense 
by setting up your audible plays. To access your audible plays, when you go into a formation, just hit the left trigger or the L2 button before you select the play, and it'll bring up the option to change your audible plays to four plays. You get a total of five audible plays because the fifth play can be completely different from these, and EA just instituted something where you can save your audible plays from game to game. So even in a practice mode, you can go into your audible plays and set them up throughout your entire playbook, or you can do it in the, the settings. You can do it any number of ways. You can do it in game, and they will save throughout every single game mode that you play. Now to properly set up your audibles, you're gonna to wanna to have four plays, and the four plays are gonna be an inside run, like the RPO read screen, which gives me the ability to hand off inside or throw it to the bubble screen, which I use for both purposes, but ideally you wanna have an inside run just in case your opponent isn't coming out in a run heavy enough defense. Say they don't have any linebackers in the field. Say they're spreading too far apart to try to stop outside run plays. At that point, if you read that, you're gonna to wanna to switch to your inside handoff. If they're pinching the defensive line, or say once again, they don't have enough, uh, you know, enough linebackers on the field, they don't have enough people in the box, then you would have an outside run. The speed option would be my outside run in this particular offense. So I have the ability to threaten inside or outside when it comes to run plays. If you don't have that and you see a weakness in the run defense, you can't take advantage of it because you don't have your audible set. The next thing you're going to want to have is a inside pass play. Typically something like a double drags concept is going to be very good. I have that represented here by the inside cross. And you're also going to have an outside pass play, which I have represented here in the Z spot. Both of these pass plays will beat both man and zone. The inside cross double drags will beat man coverage and zone coverage because that's what double drags do. And then the outside pass play, I have a man side, which is going to be the left side here with the zig and the in route. And I also have a zone side, which is going to be um, something I create out of the Z spot on the right side with the corner route. Once you have all that set up, you can really pick whatever play you want as your fifth play as you'll have a lot of options and a lot of times you can change them. But I also find it's helpful to choose a play that's a one play touchdown that threatens deep like the PA deep out which is something that I already put out a full breakdown video of. So if you guys want to check that out, I have that on screen at the end of the video as this is an offense that I already broke down in gameplay. Next, I'm going to go over how to read a defense, starting off with how to read your run fits. On offense, you always want to try to run the ball first, but you really need certain things to happen for that to be capable. On this play here, I'm going to do a box count. He's got six guys in the box, so I know that I really can't run up the middle since I only have five blockers. And he also has outside containment with his defensive ends being wider than my tackle, so I really can't run to the outside either until he shifts his defensive line in the direction of the most likely run, which would be an inside zone. And now his defensive end is covered up by my left tackle, so I can go to the speed option and run the ball knowing that I I have the edge before the play even starts, which is a very easy read that you should make every single time. When it comes to passing though, you're gonna to wanna to try to read the entire defensive coverage so you can attack the weaknesses of that coverage. If you guys don't know how to do that, I'll show you guys in a very quick tutorial. This is very simple. Starting with looking at the outside cornerback starting drop depth away from the line of scrimmage. On this play here, you can see that this cornerback in front of the receiver is five yards off the line of scrimmage, which is indicative of a cover two zone. As you can see here, he's gonna cover that area so he wants to start off in that area. You can also tell that the car, the starting distance off the line of scrimmage on the tight end side is different because tight ends aren't as fast, so cornerbacks don't start to play as far away. So always look at the cornerback starting depth in front of the receivers, not the tight ends. After that, we'll also switch over to cover three, and you'll notice that the cornerback's starting depth drops to about eight yards off. And once again, the cornerback in front of the tight end doesn't move at all. But you can see, this is a cover three depth. Because they have to cover deep and they don't want anything to get behind them, they'll typically, they'll typically start about eight yards off the line of scrimmage. You also have cover four palms, which is going to be the same way. You'll have uh, the same eight yard depth of the cornerbacks. The only way to tell the difference between cover three and cover four is by looking at the safeties. You can see on the last play that when we were in cover three, that we had a single high safety, which is pretty indicative of either cover one man or cover three. When it comes to cover four, you'll see that they both start at about the 10 to 12 yard mark. Typically when they're offset like this, based on the fact that we have tight ends on the right side, you can see where the one safeties drop down a little bit more than the side that has the receivers. That's because this defense here, everybody's responsible for 10 yards uh, in the quarter section of the field that they're responsible for. So they're all gonna wanna be about a 10 yard depth. After that, if you get a, a split coverage, which will be something like a cover three cloud, you'll notice that typically you'll have different starting depths of the cornerbacks naturally. And typically this outside cornerback here, which isn't moving because there's only tight ends over there. If there was a receiver on that side, since he's in a, uh, a cloud flat, he'll be five yards off the line of scrimmage while the curl flat will be eight yards off the line of scrimmage. When it comes to man coverages, we'll have to switch over to another formation here. You'll notice if we start in cover three, we have that same look here where uh, we get the single high safety but if I switch over to cover one man which is also going to be a single high safety look the only thing that really changes is the uh, the, the the safety 
change his position and have a little bit more outside leverage on the tight end. So there's not a lot of the ways to tell the difference between cover three and cover one before the play starts. So that's going to be a scenario you're going to have to watch to see if the receivers or if the cornerbacks follow the receivers after the play starts or if they're just uh, dropping back into a zone. That's going to be the easiest way. When it comes to cover zero, though, this is going to be simple. As you're going to see, pretty much everybody is going to be, and we'll have to change this play. I think we're in the wrong formation, actually. We're going to go over to uh, this one here. We'll choose the Mike Blitz zero, and we'll see how everybody's going to be pretty much close to the line of scrimmage. There's no deep safeties. As you can see, this is one of the easiest ways to tell that it's a cover zero because there's no deep safety help. And last but not least, when it comes to cover two man, you'll notice that the cornerbacks are pressing because this is one of the few pressing coverages. Now, if you still need help reading defenses, you could always see what the last defense your opponent was in simply by hitting the right stick to the right from this screen here. And you can see how it shows the previous play that my opponent ran. As most people will run the same play over and over and over or enough that you'll have a pretty good idea of what they're using. On defense, we want to do the exact same things. For audible plays, I find it's best to have at least one cover two. And that's because cover two is the best outside run defense because these cover two cornerbacks both have run fits. When it comes to inside run defense, one of the best plays to use is going to be cover for palms because this is the only defense where the safeties have run fits, meaning that the safeties will come down into the box and play the, the run like uh, linebackers as long as you don't guess pass. And cover for palms is the best one because I went over this in previous videos, how this is also the best RPO defense. So for run defense and RPO defense, these are probably two of the most important plays to have in your audibles. After that, you can really have whatever you want. I personally like to have a cover zero because I still find it's one of the better defenses to run commit from from time to time as I find that if I know my opponent's going to run stays close to the goal line or something like that I'll switch over to cover zero and I'll run commit and I feel like it has the least amount of penalty it still has a penalty but it has the least the smallest after that I also find it's best to have a off uh, or a uh, offset covers like a cover three cloud or a cover six something that's just a, a little bit of a curveball to throw your opponent's way so it's not just like a straight up cover two cover three cover four because most people will struggle with defenses like this and then for my fifth and active play I typically go with cover three match because I think this is the the best defense on offense i said it's most important to try to run the ball first so on defense i'd say it's the exact same thing you want to take away the run first you always want to have outside leverage so on this formation here if i want to spread the defensive line i could do that and you can see how it does create some open uh, run lanes inside but if i bring all these guys into the box there's not really going to be any any run lanes you can see right here my opponent even if he runs inside, we have three linebackers waiting for him. He's not going to get very far. As you can see, my, my opponent didn't get anywhere. The computer didn't get anywhere. So that's number one. You always want to set up your run defense so that you have outside leverage and you also have inside gap contain, which you can do from just about any single defense in the game. When it comes to pass defense, you really have no idea what your opponent is running, but one of the most important things you can do to give yourself an idea is basically count where the receivers are because the ball has to go where the receivers are, right? So on a play like this, since there's three receivers on the left side, two of which are actual receivers, one of which is a running back, and only two tight ends on the right side, chances are it's going to go to the left side of the field based on the fact that 60% of the receivers are on that side of the field. You can also use this rationality when it comes to where the ball is on the field if i move the ball over say your opponent's starting from a hash mark if your opponent is on the sideline like this 70 percent of the field is to the left and it's also 60 percent of the receivers so if you're just playing the percentages here you know that there's about you know at least a, a majority of chance that the ball is going to go to the left side because if your opponent tries to throw to the right side say they try to throw an out route to the tight end number one their space is very limited they're not going to have much catch and run space after the fact because the sideline is going to have them hand in and the sideline is the best defender on the field the sideline basically makes every tackle and it, it's also blankets and coverage. It never allows a catch. If your opponent goes out of bounds, they go out of bounds. So you want to use that sideline in this situation and pretty much know that the ball is going to go on the other side of the field, which is really the only indicators that you have as a defensive player, aside from down and distance and the scoreboard. If it's third and long, you know your opponent's going to go long. If it's uh, third and short, you know they're probably going to go short because it's more important to get that first down. So you do have indicators while you play on what your opponent's going to do. Like, say they're down two touchdowns in the fourth quarter, you know they're going to pass. If you know that they're up two touchdowns in the fourth quarter, you know they're going to run. You have plenty of indicators aside from knowing the actual play, and all these things can guarantee that you uh, play defense to the best of your ability. So I'm going to end the video there. If you guys want to see more videos like this, please make sure to be a subscriber. Hit like button, let me know in the comment section. And if you want to see more about the offense that I was showing you guys earlier in the video, I'll have that popping up on screen. So just click links. And until next time, thanks for watching, man. Wish it out. Need more help or just want to show your support? Then head over to my Patreon and join my team where you can get exclusive content like ebooks and bonus plays as well as early access to my bids and more. Link in the description below.